I know you're going to dig this. Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. And now my studio guest is Emmett North Jr., guitarist, singers, songwriter, and producer. Welcome. Glad to be here. We're so happy to have you here. It's so important to have folks that have played such a key role in the funk history mm -hmm. and that we want to make sure everybody gets their story told. And we're so glad that you're with us today. So as we start off, I just want to um, tell me how you began mm -hmm. uh, getting interested into the music and becoming such a guitarist mm -hmm. and uh, I think I re recall you playing a little tune when you were down in Noonan, Georgia because you're originally from Middletown. Uh -huh. Went to Noonan for three years and down there you besides shooting birds you played a tune that you learned there and what well, was that tune? A friend said look I can play guitar let me show you a few things instead of I shoot birds so he says look put your fingers on here and do it just like this. And that's all he taught me. I didn't learn the rest of the song until five years later. Oh. When, when we moved back to Ohio. And when I was in uh, Middletown, watching an American bandstand with my uncle, it kind of dawned on me, maybe this is what I should be doing, because all of my aunts and uncles sang in church, you know, and my, all my uncles, I had like uh, three or four uncles, one played trumpet, one played saxophone, one played trombone, and my mother and all of her sisters played piano or organ. And so, um, watching an American bandstand, I said, I think I want to do this when I saw all the girls and stuff screaming behind Jackie Wilson and James Brown and Chuck Berry. So I went to school for uh, about a year in Lebanon and actually started writing song poems. I would listen to all of the old hits from uh, American Bandstand, but I write my own lyrics to their melodies. So in, in Lebanon, I wrote a, a, a song for my school teacher to sing the last day of school. We didn't, didn't have any guitar knowledge yet, but I sang it to a hole in a broomstick. Me and a friend of mine, we had broomsticks and uh, we had our little straw hats on and I sung the, the lyrics that I wrote for my teacher. Her name was Miss Lukens. Um, I don't even want to try and sing it right now because I'm so much beyond that now. But anyway, um, my mother and father moved to Dayton and my mother was telling me, I mean, a lot of little things in between is why I think it'd be great I could write my autobiography. My mother was saying, look, when I was carrying you, your father was in Philadelphia looking for a job. So you could have been born in Philadelphia. And I'm thinking, well, gee, maybe things that might have been a lot different I had been in Philadelphia. I might have not been in the music at all. So we moved to Dayton when I was about 12. Uh, I got introduced to the guitar again. And so I started playing guitar well, who introduced uh, you to the guitar then, when you were 12? Well, when I came to, to Ohio, I was go, you know, going to different churches, watching these gospel groups where they had guitars, bass, and drums. And that was a little bit different than listening to my mother and them singing in the choirs, so where they only had a piano or organ. And that's why I started noticing the guitar. 
I said, well, I start having guys from the gospel groups teach me a few things, a few chords, but the first guy that really got me into wanting to be a guitarist was Robert Ward. He used to be in Dayton, I guess, when I was a kid. I remember Robert This is Ward. like 50-something years ago, <laughs> maybe 60 years ago. <laughs> Anyway, he was one of he was the original guy who had the Ohio players. They used to be called the Ohio Untouchables. It was Robert Ward and Ohio Untouchables. So eventually Robert got ousted from the band because he had different type of temperaments. Uh, once at this club, used to be called the 5100 Club, he would just walk off stage and leave the band playing, you know. And, and he'd be going home somewhere, you know, get upset with somebody and just walk off the stage. But anyway, he was one of the guys I would ask to show me some things. There's a school called Irving School that used to be right across from St. Elizabeth Hospital. I used to always stand outside, even in the rain, on top of the beer carts and listen to uh, Robert Ward and Ohio Untouchables. After Robert got ousted from the band, Satch took over and it was the Ohio Players then. Then Satch's cousin, supposed to be from Hamilton, which was Sugarfoot, Leroy Bonner, moved here and took care of uh, the guitar part in, in the group. And just before he got in the group, there was another guy from Dayton, Ohio, named Little Skip, who lives in London now. He temporarily took over Robert Ward's part until Sugarfoot came into the picture. So I think he maybe played with the players, uh, Ohio and Tuttles at that time, for maybe a year or two. And he ended up leaving here going to be with the Sugar Hill Gang. Mm -hmm. And I ran into him when I was in London last, too. Told him I'd beat him over there like 10 years before, you know. But anyway, uh, I play with three different gospel groups here in town. Uh, the Gospel Travelers, the Zion Trumpeteers, and the various guitar players I met after that. I would have them always teach me something, show me something, show me what you played, you know. So... Uh, it's a funny thing, it's a lot of guitar players from Dayton, Ohio, and other places have showed me things, and I remember them all. That's what made me a, have an edge on a lot of other guitar players, because everything that I learned from one guy, I mean, I was learning stuff from David T. Walker, who had been on recordings, Ray Parker Jr. I had to learn their styles, and I had to learn their, the way they were playing chords and everything. And there was... Um, Wawa Watson, who was with on the All the Temptation stuff, who just died. I had to learn his style because those are the guys that were recording with Barry White when I got there. So, and, and, and I tell you, just before I left Dayton, uh, well, let me, it's a lot. I miss leaving out Piney Brown. I played with Piney Brown when I was 13. I had just gotten back into playing guitar again, and he took me to my first country and western bar. I never played any country music before. So on the break, we went backstage, and he said, look, do you know Wildwood Flower? I said, no, I don't know no country music. And I was a kid. And he would come by, and my mother said, look, if you want to use my son, just make sure you pay him and don't let him drink, you know? So they had to buy me Cokes and stuff like that. But anyway, Piney Brown... Um, Took me backstage and hummed this country western melody to me. No, we hear it. See if I can still play it. Um. Melody. That's a real country song. But it was like. <laughs> that kind of thing. And so, I picked it up during the break, 15 minute break, came back out stage and I played it. With Piney Brown. With Piney Brown and. The, the, the people that was at this country in Western Bar was throwing quarters and dollar bills up on stage. And then it told me, I said, Piney, maybe I better learn some more country music. <laughs> so, so I got, over the years, I've, like I said, I've been around older guys who were playing years and years before me and I met a guy in London. He says, look, he was teaching me some calypso music because I had already learned the reggae music. I was doing the...
And so I started playing reggae music, which I did a lot over in London. Um, and he taught me some clips of music, and he was saying, Emma, just learn as much as you can of different things, you know, that way you'll be a better guitar. So I did. And I left here in 1970. I was supposed to leave in 1974, near the end of 1974. I was playing with Little Dotty Peoples then. She was Pearson at the time before she moved to Atlanta to become gospel uh, sensation. I played with her in Cincinnati, parts of Kentucky, and Detroit. That was one of the most interesting places that I played. We played at a big jazz club there called Baker's Keyboard Lounge. And that's a place where George Benson had played and a lot of the Kenny Burrell. And so we played there three nights. Dottie was singing blues and jazz then. So on those three nights, I got a chance to meet Earl Clue, which is the uh, protege that Earl, uh, George Benson discovered when he came through again. Because Earl was telling me he came to, he comes there all the time. He was just checking out the new uh, band or uh, artist from Dayton, Ohio. And so I got a chance to meet him, and uh, I had been listening to him with George Benson. Like This is like early, when Earl was probably about 18. I had been listening to George and Earl on some of George's earlier stuff, while George helped him get his deal, his recording deal. And so it was kind of inspiring to me to go to Detroit and meet him, and he was there for three nights, you know, to check us out. And so we stayed friends for a couple of years, because each time I would go back to Detroit, I'd call him at his home, and... He would tell me to get places I could go buy guitar strings and stuff like that when I was in Detroit. So we stayed friends for a while. And then uh, 1974, I told Dottie Peoples I was leaving to come to L.A. And it was just me and I had two sons, but one son stayed here with my ex-wife and my other son. I took with me to L.A. on the bus. And the reason for that is my father had been telling me he had some aunt, uh, sisters and and cousins out in California, and they've been telling me since I got out of the Army in 68, I sh should go out there. So I told him, that's too far away. I don't know nothing about California. Because so I was just getting in good with Big J. Bush and the House Rockers. So I played with Big J. Bush and the House Rockers for a couple of years after I got out of the Army. Then I got married and moved to Michigan for a while. and. I even worked for General Motors and some of the other Ford, Ford Motor Company and some of the automotive places. I was making about 13 or 14 bucks an hour, but music was in my blood because each time I'd go out to a club or to a church, I'd see singers and stuff. And most of the time, I'd be working on a line at a Ford or GM plant, but in my mind, I'm thinking about songs and music and playing my guitar. So I worked uh, at General Motors for about seven months. I just told him I couldn't do it no more. I had to go back to plan, you know. So uh, I moved back to Dayton with my first son and my, my first wife. And um, we had some mishaps here where as soon as we moved here, somebody ripped us off and broke into our apartment and stuff. This was way around near uh, uh, James H. McGee, I think it is now. We around it used to be close, Western Avenue. Yeah, way around near those apartments before you get to Gettysburg. But when I moved over there, it wasn't that many buildings on that side. I so it was across the street from this nightclub, this club, remember? There's a club over there. It used to be called the Silver Fox, I think. Yes. Okay, well, across the street from there, there was only a couple of those buildings over there then. Now there's a half a dozen over there, you know, those apartments. So that's where um, the people we met, we found out later they were the ones who broke in a place. And we had just moved in, like, maybe a couple of weeks. I was back working at uh, Kimberly Clark out here near uh, between the Dayton Mall. I started doing that. Then I started playing gospel music again for a short period. So as soon as anybody knew I was in town, I was on call. Either gospel or Piney Brown or Big J. Bush. So, you know, I had options. Um, when I left Dot, I told her where I was leaving to move to California with my son. Because my father had been trying to coax me to come out here. He says, look, I used to come in, a lot, a lot of gigs uh, on the weekends, and this is like 16 or 17. Come in at 2.30 in the morning from a gig, say, how much money you make? I told him, well, I made about 20 bucks tonight. And he said, man, boy, you better, you should go on out to California and stop playing around here for these peanuts, if that's what you want to do and make some real money. 
So I just I couldn't see that yet. You know, I'd say I ain't playing that good. <laughs> but he saw my heart was in it, you know, because he would be up. That's how I really got into watching uh, scary movies. He would be up watching scary movies when I come in from my gigs at night on the weekends and kind of got into that type of stuff too. But anyway, when I moved to California in 75, it was like February 75. I should have, like I say, moved there in 74, but Dot said, I don't have a guitar player. So could you teach another guy to play my show before you go? So it like held me over another two weeks. Else I would have been gone in 74. It didn't really matter. But I, I guess timing is everything. Because when I got to LA, I had initially wrote and called Bobby Womack. That's who I was going to play with, uh, audition for in LA. And back here, people had been telling me, Man, you're too good to stay here. You need to go somewhere else, man. You can make some, you know, make something of yourself. And well, I didn't see that in me. Everybody else did, you know, other guitar players and singers and drummers and and so I just decided. Well, my father been telling me for the past three years to go to California, so the timing must have been right because I had called Bobby Womack at his record label out there and I told him who I was. I told him I was from Ohio because Bobby's from Cleveland. So we had a little bit of a bond there. I said, yeah. So I'm thinking about moving up to California, and I'd like to come and audition for you. So he said, sure, call me when you get out of here. So I did. As soon as I got to Pasadena, where my aunt lived, I gave him a call to let his office know I was in town. It's a funny story. When he did return my call, I didn't believe it was him. So I hung up on him. And this is the time when my sister had moved out there too. She had moved out two weeks before me. As my mother and father, she had been telling them that she wanted to move out there too. So she moved in with my aunt. All my aunts and stuff out there was Jehovah Witnesses. So I had to be kind of straight arrow, you know. So Bobby called and I said, who is this? He said, it's Bobby Womack. I said, nah. I thought it was my cousin playing a joke on me. So I hung up on him and he called me back. And I told my sister, I said, that sounds like my cousin Donnie playing jokes, telling him about he's Bobby Womack. So I said, you answer the phone. If the phone rang, she went and got the phone. And they called me Bernie, you know, for Bernard, my middle name. She, my sister said, Bernie, this is Bobby Womack. I said, oh, man. <laughs> I said, that could have been, that could have cost me a job, you know? So we talked, and he says, yeah, I, I heard you in town, and I wanted to return your call. And he says, I'm going to be mailing you over a few of my albums to where you're living in pa pa Pasadena so you can listen to what I'm doing and, you know, what I've been doing. Well, I told him I did a lot of his stuff when I was here in Dayton, you know, like Harry, Hippie, and stuff when I was playing with Little Dot. And I told him I liked his style of playing. And after I found out he was Sam Cooke's guitar player, I liked him even more. Because I used to do Sam Cooke stuff when I was back here in Dayton and Middletown, just singing at talent shows, you know? Like, Cupid, draw back, see? Cupid, draw back your bow, and let your arrow go straight to my lover's heart for me. I should do changes gonna come. Uh, some of them I don't wanna try and do right now, but. Two months after I got to, because um, I know you're leading me up to when you worked yeah, for Barry yeah. White and Bobby's, Isaac Hayes. Bobby's office was in the same built bank building, mm -hmm. so when I went over to Hollywood from Pasadena, which my sister drove me over because I didn't know nothing about you know L.A. is just so big, so went there and went to Bobby's office. He wasn't there in the office at the same time, so I spoke to his PR guy. They say public relations. And so he was telling me, he said, I told him I'm from Ohio. I come out here to play for Bobby Womack. I audition for him. He says, well, Bobby's not in town right now. This is like during the winter time. He says he's in New York at his record label or something. I said, well, look, tell him I come by to you know, check about doing the audition because y'all had mailed me some records over to Pasadena. And so he just started telling me, he says, well, look, he says, uh, you play guitar? I said, yeah. He said, Bobby's only going to be using you for like a month, and that's a tour of Europe. He says, he don't put you on a retainer. I said, well, what does that mean? He says, that means you get paid when you're not working, when you're not touring. 
He said, but I hear Barry White's looking for guitar players, too. See, it's, uh, he was on the eighth floor. See, Barry's office is down on the fifth floor. He says, uh, I heard he's looking for guitar players. You should check with him, too, because he said, I heard Barry put you on the retainer. That means you're going to check every week whether you're working or not. I said, well, that sounds a lot better. Because he said, if you go to tour with Bar Bobby, uh, you'll be back on the street in a month, you know, because you'll be looking for more work. So I, I took him up on that, and he said, but also, you can check with Sammy Davis Jr. His office is up on the, I think they said 10th floor, and he said, Wolfman Jack's producer is up on the 12th floor. So I went to everybody's office filling out applications. Then I went down to Barry's office, and fortunately, Barry's sister was working near the front desk. So I told her who I was, and I told her, well, I just come from, Cal uh, from Ohio, and I played guitar, and I wanted to audition you know, for a job. So she phone, made a phone call in the back in the office, and I talked to one of Barry's school friends, which is back to his, I went back and saw him, and he said, okay, I'm going to send you down to the rehearsal studio from here, which is about two miles from his office. So I went down to the rehearsal studio, and I met the rhythm section for Barry, and I tell you, um, I didn't even play for him, and they liked me. Yeah, I guess he said, man, we just like your attitude, and your character and everything. As I was telling them, I'm from Dayton, Ohio, from where the Ohio players is from. They said, oh, yeah, man, we love them Ohio players. I said, you listen like this, too, then. They said, yeah, that's fire. I said, yeah, man, uh, that's all I did. And they said, we're going to make sure you get in the band, man. So. I lived with them for three weeks where Barry was paying the hotel bill. Like, there's like the band hotel apartments. So I stayed with him for three weeks. The, the number one guitarist, they only had a guitar, drums, and bass at the time. And eventually we were going to add more guitars like he records. Because during his recordings, he was using David T. Walker, Ray Parker Jr., and Wawa Wild Wild Watson, and a couple other guys. And he wanted to have his road band be the same sound as in the studio. So he said he's going to hire some more guitar players. So this guitar player took me in and he put out all the Barry sheet music. I said, man, I don't know about no sheet music because I just, I was used to writing chords on the paper, you know. They had all the notes and she said, you ain't got to worry about that. We'll help you out. Because he said, Barry's going to be doing soul train in about three weeks and we're going to make sure I introduce you there. So I live with them, and we was up all night smoking cigarettes and drinking scotch, and you know, cheap scotch at that. Yeah, he was, actually, they retained him. They was only getting paid 100 a week at the time. This was like back in the 70s, though. So that mean they had to do their laundry and food and everything out of that. But we had to pay no rent so, and no light bill and any of that, so it made it easier. But after about six months, our pay went up. So that meant our pay uh, on the tour went up. So that meant our pay at home went up. So it was getting like maybe about two hundred a week then. So, but I mean that was good. So this particular guy, this other guitar player, he was into George Bench and a lot of other guitar players too. So he taught me a lot during the times he wasn't doing Barry White stuff. But I mean, like he's prepping me to meet Barry. So he's got records, and I guess I don't even know if they had CDs then. But he had all this stuff out with the sheet music, and we would just stay up late at night with the candles burning and say, look, man, make this chord. I say, uh, make that major seven. I say, well, I say, oh, see, that's what the name of that chord is. Because I was making chords and stuff when I was at Ladati Peoples, but I didn't know the names of them. When I got out there, I had to learn the names. So went to Soul Train with this guy, and with the band, actually, and Barry was backstage. There's a young guitar, jazz guitar player, white guy now that's really famous. He was on stage tuning up. His name was Lee Rittenauer. So Barry come from backstage, and my friend was saying, look, I'm going to tell Barry you came out here to audition for him. Forget about Bobby Womack. So that's what I told him. I says, uh, he introduced me. He said, uh, Barry, uh, this is Emmett North. He's from Ohio. He came all the way out here to audition for you for a gig. And Barry just looked at me, shook my head, and right on, you know, smoking a cigarette. And, and that was that. So two weeks later, now a week after that, his conductor came to our rehearsal studio 
to audition me and other guitar players. I mean, I still had to be auditioned by somebody, not just the guys, because the guys like me, you know. So the, the, the conductor was an old Jewish guy. He came by and he was smoking his pipe. And it's like uh, other guys lined up outside to come in. So it's, he said, play something. I said, well, what you want me to play? He said, play anything. He said, play some blues if you want to. I said, I did that, he looked at me and puffed on his pipe and sent me to another room. And next guy come in, there was a guy come in from Chicago. He didn't have a guitar case, he just had his guitar under his arm, you know. And he, funny enough, he had some blue suede shoes on. Yeah, he was a light complected brother from Chicago. He came in and he was trying to tell the conductor how the, the music supposed to go. And everybody else was listening, saying, man, this guy trying to tell the conductor how the music supposed to go. I'm like, yeah, I'm used to playing Barry White's music, and it go like this. And, and he said that the conductor was just looking at him, and everybody was whispering behind the door, said, we believe you got this gig, man. This guy's blowing his gig, <laughs> you know. They was whispering to me about this, you know. So I waited, found I passed that audition, and thought I was in, but I had one more audition to do. It was for the big man now. So I didn't know the audition was going to end up taking place at a recording studio where he recorded all his hits. So it was now me and a Jewish kid on guitar to audition. And I didn't sing, but I could hear him through the microphone talking from the rec uh, studio room, you know. He'd start one of his songs playing, and he just said, y'all play something, you know, and then he cut the speaker off again, and we would be playing. And, and didn't know until afterwards, yeah, well, you got the job. Two months after I was in L.A., I had a gig with Barry White, and I was on my way to Europe for the first time after, you know, being in the Army. It was the first time going over there on a real tour. Some funny, a lot of funny things happened, so I got to write my autobiography. I want to anyway. There's just so much to tell. Um, my first gig... I played with Barry before we went to, a, well, I don't know the first, but twice we played in New York at Radio City Music Hall. And they had one of these stages that would come up from the bottom of the basement. And we were sitting there, and I was so dazed because it was like a make-believe land. And all these orchestra, all these string players, stuff behind me, sound like I had stereo headphones on. And the show had actually started. And I'm just sitting there in a daze, you know, holding my guitar. You know, because we're sitting down in the orchestra, and other guitar players say, hey, Emmett, man, the show didn't start. I said, oh, <laughs> So I had to start playing. And once other time that happened to me in Munich, we played in front of 10,000 people. When the curtains opened up, we was in the Olympic Stadium. And I could barely see people. That was another time I froze up. I, I, I was like flabbergasted. Couldn't believe it. And the guy said, hey, man, the show done started again. I said, okay. <laughs> and come to find out, one of my former uh, musicians that played in, in one of my L.A. bands said he was a kid, and he was over in, in uh, Germany with his father. His father was in the military, but he was like a military kid. And he said he was backstage and saw me playing. And I didn't know that till like about 20 years later when he played with me in L.A., you know. And I said, well, that's a heck of a coincidence. So anyway, I've traveled all over the world with Barry from South America, Central America, so North how long America. Were, so how long were you with Barry? I was with Barry from 1975 to 1979. Then I had a break when he wasn't doing anything. I got a shot doing a little bit of extra work in the Blues Brothers movie. It's how I met Isaac Hayes' drummer for a second time. Okay. Now, that's my lead up to getting my job with Isaac Hayes. Because Barry wasn't doing much, and I was doing extra work in the Blues Brothers movie and met the drummer. And I told him I'd met him through another guitar player from, named Boots from Dayton who had played with Isaac like eight or nine years earlier. So he said, yeah, I remember you, man. He said, you going to be here tomorrow? I said, yeah, I'm making 50 bucks a day to come to this extra do this extra work, so I ain't making no money, you know, playing. So I did four do days of shooting. He said, look, come back tomorrow, and I'm going to give you a phone number to call. And actually, during that same time, I had just finished up my work with Wolfman Jack, 
which was a short stint because he died, you know. But anyway, he uh, says, come back and get his number. I got the number from him. Called the guy, and it was Isaac's bodyguard. And I told him, well, look, I had been playing with Barry White, but Barry was like on a hiatus right now. He wasn't doing any, any touring. See, uh, I said, you play guitar? I said, yeah. See, Isaac's looking for a lead guitar player, you know, to play all the effects and all that stuff, wah-wah pedal. So I said, okay, I'll do all of that. So tell him that's what I do with Barry. He said, well, okay, um, Isaac, gonna, we're going to send you some of Isaac albums out there, the same way they did when I was getting with Bobby Womack. They sent me three albums to listen to Isaac's stuff, what he had just recorded. And he says, uh, listen over this, and we'll get back with you. So two weeks later, this, he called me back, said, we're sending you a ticket for Atlanta, Georgia. I said, that's where Isaac was stationed at the time. So I actually, I was there for a special project. Isaac was working on an album for Linda Clifford, which is a black soul singer. And as I was told, Curtis Mayfield had something to do with it. It's like they were producing this artist together. One was doing, I guess, the music, and the other was maybe some lyrics or something. But I got to Atlanta, Georgia, and Isaac, sometimes I would be afraid to say something to him because he was a lot different than Barry. Barry was a little bit more temperamental at times, you know. He'd be upset with so and so and so, this, you know, using like a vulgar and Sometimes it was just to, I guess, shock you. Sometimes it was just like that. And he'd go and he'd be laughing about it sometimes, you know, because him and the manager used to do that at times. But anyway, getting back, back to Isaac, Isaac had us up in a, a band in a hotel uh, down in Atlanta. We were like in the Holiday Inn. And some Africans had, had been taking care of Isaac's business because he was going through all the tax problems, you know, and back taxes and stuff. So. Whenever I got a check, it was from a catering company. It was an African catering company. They say, well, that's because they had to make sure Isaac didn't show all of his finance, you know. So we were getting paid through these people who were, I guess, handling his business. So he came by the hotel one day, and I'm the newest guy in the band. So we had just been sitting there drinking beer, getting wasted, drinking those big cans of beer. And Isaac was more a, fit, a fitness fanatic. He ran a lot. He worked out a lot. And it was kind of unusual, but, you know, his age, he was still working out. So he came by one day, and I was sauced up in the beer, and he said, hey, new man, you want to come and run with me, with him and his friends? And I said, well, shoot, I, I can't not say no. So <laughs> I went running with them up and down in Georgia Hills, and I was just a Beer was coming out of me, say, hey, young brother, you can't hang? I said, no, nah, Isaac, I said, I got to go back to the hotel. I've just been drinking almost two cans of beer, you know? And so him and his buddy just headed on down over them hills and kept running. And there was two gigs I did with Isaac's band when I was in Atlanta. We played once in a nightclub as his band. Then we played for a record label. I don't know what late record label now could have been. MCA Records or Warner Brothers or something, but we played at a hotel there for, for them, and that turned out pretty good. It was playing, there was a group called Odyssey back in the 70s. They were there, so I think it was their label, and they wanted us to play for them. And that's probably the last time I've even heard of them, too. I see that you did work with uh, New Birth. Well, actually, I did some writing and recording with New Birth. They're some of my closest friends. And I also see that you did Gloria Gaynor when you were over in England. That was on tour with Barry. She oh. was on stage with us. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I find that you've had such an inter interesting career, and it's so exciting, and I, I'm just going to, first of all, there, and, and then I want you to tell me, I'm showing one of your CDs, and that you have how, nine CDs? Eight. Eight CDs. Okay, but this is one, uh, the Emmett North Jr. CD, and it's called the Gallery of Groove. That's the band that I had. The, the yeah, the band. The, 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 uh, but the, the CD's called The Groove. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to share this because I'm going to ask, right after I put this down, there's more CDs I have here, but I wanted to let you know he has eight out. But the reason why I chose this one is because of the hat. 
And there is has to be a story behind the signature hat. Well, I like hats. And I guess I'm from the old school. A lot of people don't wear, everybody's wearing baseball caps now. So I had, I guess it, it became my own signature because um, these were the type of hats I would wear. I had once upon a time though I had a British bowler, but that was even pre-LA uh, days. I don't know, I just wore hats. And they would be kind of stylish instead of just a regular old pullover hat. So this was more my, um, I guess, my signature. So when I would go places, people would ask, where's your hat? And I'd say, okay, let me get my hat. So now uh, I keep my hat. Whenever you uh, perform. So, so tell me, what, what um, give me three highlights of your, I'm sure you had lots of them, but three things that you would tell people that were interested in being a guitarist or being in this business. What are three things you would tell people that, to either positive or negative or, mm -hmm. to, or, or as advice? Well, this could be um, toward any entertainer, whether it's guitar, singer, bass, drummer. I just think you just have to be true to yourself. You have to believe in yourself. Um, like during the time that my father was trying to get me to move to California, I didn't really believe in myself that much. I say. And, and, and it's like this. There's a lot of good musicians and entertainers still in Dayton, but to be honest with you, I think a lot of them are half-stepping, you know, because you really have to pay dues, too. You can't, I, I have told a few of my friends, so you just can't be playing around the clubs, around Dayton and Dayton area, and your family and your friends, and I always tell you how good you are. I say, you really find out how good you are when you leave home. And so, in, in, in other words, I took a chance. I knew I wasn't that great. When I got out there with Ray Park and Wawa and all those guys that used to cut and hit records, I say, well, I now looked at my guitar in my hands and said, now do it or shut up, you know? So I had to get out there and prove myself. But I had to be learning at the same time, else I would have never made it. I had to listen to other people pick up other styles, just like getting with Barry White was the opening of all my other jobs. As soon as I told, they found out with Isaac that I played with Barry White, of course, as soon as I had a friend who helped me, a, a black friend of mine from, um, I think it's Winston-Salem, uh, I don't know if it's in South or North Carolina now, but I met him in L.A. in the apartments I was living. He helped me get my job at Wolfman Jack. Yeah, was, I, I guess I, I hate to interrupt, but did you ever play? Did you ever go back and play for Bobby Womack? Never did. Okay, I, I just I, wanted long to. Long story there, too. I well, just wanted to. Short to, story. I wanted to know because. We ran into each other three times. Bobby Womack is, the, is really the start of your My career yeah. in, in California. I tell you, I uh, ran into Bobby once at the supermarket. He was in front of me at the line. I just happened to look up. I said, oh, man, how, he was out in Hollywood. I said, funny place meeting you here and him being in front of me in line. So we started, he asked me what I was doing and, and um, I told him I had gotten my job with uh, Barry White. He said, hey, yeah, man, what's Barry doing? And we talked for a few minutes till we got through line. The, uh, when I was living in Hollywood, the NAACP's branch noticed me somehow. Somehow my name got in here. So they were having meetings up at Jim Brown's house for some reason, and they wanted invited me to come. So I got a chance to meet Jim Brown. And Bobby Womack was there too. And he said, well, we invited Barry, but he said, is Barry coming? I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> I said, he lived in a different house, you know. So he, I didn't think Barry was going to show up, you know. But anyway, I got a chance to see Bobby again and, and meet Jim, um, Jim Brown. And the third time we ran into each other, these are all years apart now. This was late at night. I had temporarily got a little sideline job, you know, working at a gas station. This was another time that, this is like when I first moved back to L.A. in 85. This was my second time with Barry White. So I got called back twice. No, I actually got called back the third time. I didn't go back the third time. So I wanted to do my own thing. 
So anyway, um, we were at a stop like late at night, 2.30 in the morning. Bobby had a little sports car, and at that time he had a big afro. So this is one of those sports cars where you couldn't really see clear, the, the clear, clear glass, uh, so it was a convertible top. They had a plastic kind of glass. But I knew Bobby's afro, and I'm behind him, and it's only me and him at the, uh, so I pulled over to the other lane, they get beside him so I could holler, say, hey, Bobby, hey, Bobby. I say, it's Emmett, man, Emmett North from Ohio. And he said, hey, man, where, where you going? I told him I just got off a little extra job I had. And um, he said he was headed home, and I was headed home as I was just getting off from work. And oh, that was the fourth time. I met Bobby once again at a gas station. And I couldn't go with him at the time. He says, look, man, you should come on up to the office. Uh, Shares up to the office, and we up there jamming, man. Bring your guitar. But see, I wasn't living in Hollywood, and I was staying with my sister, which is in West Covina at the time. This is about 28 miles outside of L.A. And I had come into town to take care of some doctor business. And I said, oh, man, I wish I could. I said, but I got to go back, you know, back to uh, West Covina area. So it was the fourth time. I, we never did really hook up except talking to each other. So that was the end of that. Then uh, my best friend who died in Pasadena, which is another the guy I was living with before I moved back, he told me he was out in Palm Springs, and he said, guess who I was sitting at the bar with? He said, Bobby O'Mac. And Bobby said he looked over at him. He said, you look familiar. He says, yeah, uh, my name is Michael Noons. He says, my father, Larry Noons, is the guy who discovered Barry White. And they were all for me because the officers was in that same building, you know. So he came back and told me, he said, man, guess I ran into Bobby Womack at the, at the, I said, would you, he said, I was telling him about you again. He said, yeah, I remember Emmett. I said, well, you, you tell him about getting me some work, you know. <laughs> and then later, I guess a year or so later, Bobby died. So, so I mean, that's the only thing that kind of disheartened me and kind of really brought me back to date now that I wasn't working. Everybody that I've played with that were big in the industry is dead. And that's Bobby, Bobby O'Mac, Chuck Berry, Barry, Isaac, Wolfman Jack. And those are the main people from the 70s and 80s who were. I even had pictures of me and um, Don Cornelius in my home, but he's dead too. So. <laughs> but, well, New Birth, they aren't all dead, are they? The main leader died, um, gee, it's been a while now at least 20 years ago. But I am in touch with some of the people, like one of the sax players, um, he lives over in Richmond, Indiana, and we just found each other, I guess, about eight, nine months ago. So I didn't know he was out this way, too. I left him in L.A. So I said, yeah, I'm back with my first wife, and we living in Richmond, Indiana. I said, well, that ain't about 30-something miles from here. So we talked uh, last week, and he also um, wanted to make sure he could get in on this um, music hall thing, because I was telling him, I said, I'm being entered into Dayton's uh, Music Hall of Fame and, and, and ex exhibition center. He said, yeah, I said, well, you might be interested. He said, yeah, tell the guy. I'd like to be in being interested in that, too, because I said, I've seen um, uh, George Clinton here looking at the, uh, the museum or whatever they call it on tape on the computer. And I see Bootsy Collins stuff, I think, is in there, and he's from Cincinnati. So he said, yeah, man, make sure I can get in. I said, okay, I'll uh, get some information from him. And, he, and uh, uh, David said, well, give him my number and have him call me. So he may have called David by now. Well, I, I, I want to say that, uh, Emmett, it has been a pleasure. And uh, before I close out, you want to give me about a medley of some of your favorite music. You know, you talked about George Benson. Yeah, we talked about Isaac. We talked about uh, Barry. We we talked about the new birth. When, um, but then again, too, you have been doing your own thing. So, um, why don't you give me about a three-minute serenade or medley of things that you okay, really like? Well, actually, I've been working on this George Benson stuff almost a year, because I was supposed to have been doing it on tour, you know, but uh, George Benson tribute tour. And like I say, it kind of went down the tube, so as me and that agent fell out. 
And so I figured, well, I can't let all that go to waste. You know, so I may as well at least keep up on it just in case something break through. Maybe somebody want to, you know, put a show or something that, together and make, do my Benson tribute show. So I've been like doing, say, hey, um, to say to you just before we go tell me why it's so important for us to have a funk museum the Dayton is I guess you call it, it, was, it, it came about because of the funk and the blues actually I was just explaining this to some a, a young lady last night on the internet she's into the hip-hop thing I'm just I was trying to explain to her I says uh Hip hop is good, but this is not a hip hop city. Dayton is really strictly R and B, funk, and blues. So it's not really much jazz either, but it really started from the R and B, the blues, and the funk. And that's from all the way back to Piney Brown and Big J Bush 
to Robert Warden, Ohio Untouchables, to Lakeside, to Ohio and Players, to Slave, uh, Heat Wave, it's all in there together. And this Dayton is really a funk and R&B blues town. Simple as that. And thanks to uh, David Webb's efforts that we're being able to recognize that uh, we should have the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center here in Dayton, Ohio. I want to thank Emmett North Jr. Thank so you. much for being with us today, and I've been entertained, and I'm really excited about all of that. However, this is Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles. Until the next time, keep it funky. Thank you.